Hello. It is a not quite last minute, not quite a surprise, sort of a surprise, sort of last minute, uh, trusty live chat and live hall because I've been trying to do a couple releases a week, got my live sales on Thursdays, try and drop something at least on Sundays, and then also try and do something in the middle of the week. And for the past month, that is just not, not been happening at all. Uh, so I had planned fixing that and I'd planned on having something post tonight and we'll just say it didn't happen. So I really have to kind of get into the, I, I just have to get in the headspace of the fact that now that uh, my business travel, my day, my day job, my real job, uh, that that has basically started opening back up. I'm traveling for that community theater. Thank all the heavens and anything that can be thanked um, is opening back up. But that now means I'm in rehearsals for a show and I'm trying to do eBay, Etsy and YouTube live sales and shipping. And it's, it's been a little bit of a balance uh, problem. So I didn't even finish my ship, my uh, invoicing today from my live sale on Thursday, uh, because I got back yesterday, I uh, had to go to the theater and get stuff done and then tried to have a little bit of a life. And, um, today I would do a bunch of invoicing, but I still have one, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like six or seven things I still have left to invoice. So I got to figure out how to balance it all. And I had no idea if anyone was even going to be around. Uh, you know, it's a basically a beautiful, well, sunny, but extremely hot and humid day here in Chicago. But it is still sunny. So uh, around here, the fireworks probably won't be happening until 9.15 to 9.30. I can't remember what the post said. Um, so I'm going to try and finish before that. Not that I have any in interest in uh, going outside and watching the fireworks, but some people do. So I don't know, you know, East Coasters, you know, maybe you'll hit your fireworks earlier. So you may need to whatever. Um, but I'm going to not try and do the three hour chat I had uh, had before. Um, but I'm happy to see that people are actually around, you know, so either you're also inside your air conditioned home, uh, not dealing with the heat or, you know, 4th of July just wasn't a big picnic you know, you just weren't into the picnic or pool party uh, scene. Uh, so you're just hanging out here. So that's great. Uh, we got Book Bewitched was the first one in already saying I'm good, I was going to be late. So uh, thanks for joining there. We got uh, Katie's Katie's available. Uh, Katie, check an email I just sent you uh, a little bit ago. And Carrie is in. Let's see, does Carrie? Yeah, Carrie was actually one of the invoices I got. Out. So thanks, Carrie. Um, uh, Proud American, actually, Carrie and Proud American right next to each other because I invoiced Carrie to ship something to Proud American. So fun how that happens. Deb is in the house, Deb Sherman, and Kim Z coming also in from Ohio. And let's see, Tia Fane, Tim coming in from Canada. And let's see who else? Got the Proud Americans in Ohio. Oh, we got a Terp. We got Chad coming in from Maryland. Uh, Claudia Patterson. I think I got your invoice done. Maybe I didn't. I remember writing a little sheet with your name on it. I just can't remember if I actually invoiced it. Um, you know, it's is it's a just like I said, it's a different it's a different mindset that I have to try to re figure out. How am I going to balance all of this and keep up with watching YouTube videos and live hauls and all the stuff that all the all the other cool resellers are doing? I definitely like to see all that stuff. It's, it's just hard. So I, I give full credit to people that are, are able to juggle this better than I am. I can barely run a sale and watch the chat at the same time. So, you know, this is going to be another test where I get to actually watch the chat, hopefully talk to you guys, kind of showing a little sneak peek of some of the stuff that I got. Uh, let's see, Sharon's in the house. Uh, Jean Marie, let's see, oh, Jean Marie. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you got your invoice. This is embarrassing. Um, let's see, Dawn is in the house. I've got, actually, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Dawn, well, not about Dawn, but about uh, Dawn's uh, charity. Um, I almost said it earlier because Deb Sherman is here, and Sherman is the most famous dog from the Just One More Docs and Rescue organization. Um, he was in the dog bowl several years ago. But anyway, um, we've got, uh, oh, and Katie got my, Katie got my, my email. Hey guys, she's here. And Katie's in her car, <laughs> so I don't know what Katie's up to. But Katie's in her car. Yep, I went for a little picnic at Sonic, so very exciting. 
Well, that's good. You know, because I'm complaining about the heat, but you have to have me beat. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's been like 99 today, 98, and it's been pouring down rain. Uh, rain has finally settled a bit, but I mean, it was just like pouring buckets. So it's it's been wild. Well, appreciate you finding time. I literally 10 minutes ago, I'm like, okay, really, I'm just going to hang out, going to chat. I'm like, hey, Katie, you want to jump on? <laughs> so I didn't even know if she was around. So I saw her in the chat. I'm like, oh, maybe she didn't see the email. So anyway. Um, so just, you know, say, say a few hellos. Uh, um, I think proud American had found Katie long before he found me. Um, and it looks like Carrie and proud American found each other. So that's great that they're supporting each other. Uh, let's see. Oh, so Tia Fain said she went, he went to the flea market today. Oh, and picked up, oh, vintage Halloween. Nice. I, I was, ten well, okay. There is a flea market today. First I slept in because I had to get up early yesterday and my day was completely not my own uh, yesterday. And so by the time I got to bed, I actually slept in this morning. And so by the time I woke up, I was faced with the fact I hadn't finished my invoicing. I haven't finished shipping stuff that, you know, I've got to get some eBay shipments out. I just, I've got stuff. I'm, I've got a, some, a big presentation on Tuesday. I have to learn my lines for the show that opens on Thursday. And I decided not to go to the flea market because I opened up my app and I saw the high was 92 today. <laughs> like, yeah. All right. That's not, there's too many things going against it. I did not go to the flea market and they only do it once a month. So it's one of those cases that I will just have to wait till August when it will probably be even worse. <laughs> really, really hot. Yes. I see people coming to uh, Florida in July and I'm like, no, 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 bad idea. <laughs> Well, I remember as a kid, we'd go to Disney World. We went to Disney World a couple of times. We went to other places in Florida. A big thing was we would, we would go camping. And the summer was when we'd have to do it because the, the kids were out of, you know, we're off school. Uh, I don't know if my parents' job, if they, like, if that was a better time for them to take off. I, we just, we always did it in the summer. So I just always was growing up with this idea that Florida was the surface of hell and they're like, it was just like that all the time because I, you know, as a kid, you don't think about the time of year and how it changes and, you know, you know, it doesn't snow down there. So, you know, do you really even get, cause where you're at, cause where you're at, do you get any seasons at all? Like, do you have a spring? Do you have a fall or is it all just death? No, it's all just the surface of the sun, typically. We do get some cold weather, you know, October, November, December, but it's like 50s. And usually, you know, by the mid-afternoons, you're already up to 80s, you know. So, and the weather's just not, I think the last time it snowed was 1989. And, and we only got an inch of snow. But if you look at some of the old pictures of Jacksonville, they had to shut down all the bridges because, you know, the snow and people don't know how to drive in it. And so there are all these people suddenly trapped downtown where the office buildings are and all of that kind of thing. And you can see people at these four way stops when they had that back in the day. They don't have those now. And the toll bridges and everything. And people are literally just so confused. They don't know what to do. There'll be like pictures of these cars with snow at the intersection all just parked there because they, they're just so confused. So yeah, we don't we don't get that kind of thing in Florida. <laughs> I remember when you started saying that people like not being able to drive in it, which is understandable because the combination I, I lived in DC for a while, which I would never consider the South, but just ask anyone there that is South of the Mason Dixon line. They claim they never get snow. That's a total fallacy. They get snow, but they're not prepared for it. And so then as you go farther South, they don't have the big salt trucks. They don't have the plows. They don't have anything. And so you do, you get people that just are not used to driving and there's accidents all over the place. And this is for Dawn who's here because Dawn and I used to work together my literally my very first day uh, working at the company in Maryland, it was in January. That was when I started working there. There was a snowstorm and I was going through training at the same time. The woman from the uh, a sales manager from Florida was going through training. Now she'd already been with the company for a couple of years. She was coming in to get training on something different, but we just were doing it at the same time. I meet her for the very first time and she hands me the keys to the rental car. 
And I'm oh. like, what? And she's like, yeah, it's snowing. I'm not dealing with this. And I laughed and she's like, no, 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 no. I'm not driving. You have to drive. I'm like, well, the rental car's in your name. She's like, I don't care. <laughs> she's like, I didn't know it was going to snow. And so she, I had to drive all week. I basically had to shuttle her back and forth from the hotel to the office simply because she's like, I've never driven in snow before. She's like, and she was terrified the entire time I was driving because she just wasn't used to it. So yeah, so Don, 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 Don knows exactly who I'm talking about too. Um, and it was, it was just one of those crazy things. And you just, I, being from Chicago, you know, Tim being from Canada, we don't, we're not used to the idea that people literally don't know how to drive in snow or haven't driven in snow. That's just part of our daily, you know, daily need. When, when our daughter, my daughter turned 16, turned 16 in the summer, gave her, her own car, gave the keys to the car. She went to a private school. She started driving herself back and forth to school about a half an hour each way. That December, January, whenever with the first snow, she's like, well, are you guys going to drive me in? My, my wife at the time and I, we laughed I'm like, no, it's your job. <laughs> you have to figure it out because if you're going to live in Chicago, you need to figure out how to drive in the snow. And she did. And she can. Like now she's an adult and she's on, you know, doing all of her own things. And she doesn't have to worry about, I don't know how to drive in the snow. I don't know how to do, you know, it's just, it just comes with the territory. Yeah. And Dawn is from Illinois. Oh, wow. So her first car was an MGB that she drove year on. All right. I will admit my first car was a, <laughs> the weirdness of my life. My first car was a panel van that used to haul bodies to the funeral home. And no, I am not making that up. And my first, so that was my first car. I, my birthday is in October. So I had that uh, van. It was rear wheel drive. It did not have windows in the back. So the first time I went to pick up a girl for a date, her parents wouldn't let her get in the car. Um, but that's a whole other story. But um, I drove that into the winter and it, I was, I felt I was going to die. You know, the rear wheel drive is like a totally different driving experience for those who have not done it on the snow. So after about a month or so of the winter, it's like, yeah, we need to get something different. So I don't kill myself, but so rear wheel drive, little, little cars. I've seen cars not being able to, we don't have hills in Illinois and I've have seen cars not be able to make it up the hill. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, just like you look at the street, it doesn't even look like a hill and you, you find the car, the car will know it's a hill because it won't go up the ice. So my mom would have to put chains on their tires when they lived in Missouri, just to get up the big hill in town. Yeah. And the car wouldn't even make it up the hill and they'd have to get, you know, several tries to just get enough traction to get up the hill. Now, I would have thought that that was far enough south that they wouldn't have like serious. So was that more of a combination? They're more southern, so they didn't have salt trucks. They didn't have plows. Or is it just more rural? And so if you had snow, you were just on your own. I don't know. I'd have to ask mom if they had. I'm sure they had salt trucks at some point, but they lived in Cape Girardeau. So Cape Girardeau is a very, very small town. It's about two hours south of uh, St. Louis. So I'm sure they didn't have the kind of things that larger cities would have. And uh, I, Grandpa just was used to putting chains on the tires to make it around town. Tigers is uh, reminiscing about uh, snow plows in alleys. I didn't actually live in the city of Chicago, but I had relatives who did. And that was also a very real challenge. Um, snow plows, if they came down the alley at all, would just push all the stuff into the, into the uh, garage doors. And there's more than once that I would travel. I've, uh, most of my adult career, I've traveled for work. And there have been times uh, parking in the long-term parking lot at O'Hare that I'd come back in the winter and my car was just completely covered in a mound of snow that had been plowed through the parking lot. So as I, as I did more and more of it, I would start, I was like, Hey, can I fly out of Midway? Because Midway's long-term parking, there was a garage. So it was worth uh, being able to park in the garage. All right. So here'd be the case. So, uh, so Daniel is, is in Illinois, but he's Southern Illinois, not as South as Cape Girardeau. So not as far as South as your family. So first, hi, Daniel. Um, I'm assuming Daniel gets decent amount of snow, but I'm thinking you're starting to get far enough South that maybe you don't get heavy, heavy snow. So do people know how to drive in snow down your way, Daniel, 
or are they pretty much out of control? All right, well, we got New England Thrifter who probably can show us all how it's done because, uh, <laughs> you know, New England really knows how to get all that snow because then they get all the moisture pulling it, just dumping it. I'm far enough away. I don't get lake effect snow, but that is a very real thing. Um, let's see, it's a bookie witch. So Seattle doesn't get much snow, I can't imagine. Uh, so she must be asking, answering somebody else's question. Hi. But... Seattle, a lot of people there don't have ACs, I think I was reading somewhere, even because their temperatures are so good. And lately it's been really hot. So that's become a problem for people not having ACs. So I, I feel better being 4th of July and we're talking about snow. You know, so like get that mental, the mental thought that maybe it'll cool off at some point. So I will, we are doing a little bit of a live chat. We're doing a little bit of a live haul. So I do have Christmas stuff. I don't have a lot, but I figure, hey, this is a good time to talk about Christmas. So first, let me say, uh, first, again, thanks everyone for joining me. Uh, there are a couple of people are popping in that I didn't say hi to. So hello, uh, Reese, rise up. I'm assuming is how you would say that. All right, so Daniel's answering, after the first snow and a few car wrecks, people catch up. That is true. People do forget after about eight months of not driving in the snow <laughs> that they need to slow down. Um, New England thrifter, driven in a blizzard, you know, because that, you know, that's like a Tuesday. So you, you just, it's when you're in New England, it's kind of parts with part of the territory. Um, but so I did, I traveled North. Uh, I do have a day job that requires me to travel on occasion and I have not done any traveling in over a year as many people, uh, also experienced. And so this was my first away trip. I took a vacation. I did a couple of like road trips, but this was the first one that the schedule was not built around my own choices. It was built around my job. And so I drove to Minneapolis and then did uh, sales calls primarily. Actually, all of the sales calls were in Minnesota. I was originally supposed to go to South Dakota. That portion of the trip got canceled. So I just stayed in Minnesota and ended up heading north. And so if you join my live sale on Thursday, I was actually in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, and it was actually beautiful there. It was only like 65 degrees. It was just like a perfect combination. Uh, and then I drove home just, you know, if, if you remember your geography, uh, mid, upper Midwest geography. So Duluth is right along the Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota border. And it actually made more sense to drive straight through uh, Wisconsin to come home, even though it wasn't interstate, it was a more direct route. So it was not fun uh, driving in, even though it was a more rural area, it's 4th of July weekend. So like driving up to Duluth, there was actually heavy traffic. And I seemed to be the only person driving without a boat behind me or a camper or a kayak on my roof. Like everyone was heading north to do their summer cabins, whatever they have. They were all going doing their vacation starting on Thursday. So Friday, I drove back through Wisconsin. I didn't have a lot of time to do sourcing on this trip because I was working, uh, but I did squeeze in a couple and I did find some um, Christmas stuff. So I'll just go ahead and start with a few things that I got. And some of these will just end up going into like probably mystery boxes. Um, some of them might get sold on my sale. I'm not, I don't have too much that's gonna go into Etsy or eBay, but there might be some. So these are, I've carried these before. They're, those, they're just those little small, for very small taper candles, uh, the little candle holders. But I got a set of Christmas ones. And I believe if I read at the bottom correctly, I believe they say West Germany on the bottom. They're all the same. They're not high quality. They're just ceramic. Um, they're cute. I've found them in other holiday patterns and sometimes they're sold in a box set with multiple holidays. I just happen to have almost only had two because I just about dropped one, but I happen to only have a set of the three. They're all identical. Um, so I thought that was, those were cute. I think those came from a garage sale. I did stop at a couple of garage sales and we talked about this Thursday. Uh, that was, we're in Minnesota. So I did like Minnesota stuff on the way up to Duluth and then some Wisconsin stuff on the way home. So those I think came from a garage sale. This came from a thrift store that I'd never heard of. Uh, also in Minnesota, this was in Minnesota, but it's a little handkerchief with an embroidered uh, Christmas bow on uh, with Christmas ornaments, like little glass Christmas ornaments hanging off of it. This a little handkerchief. And that so, was shiny bright. Yeah, they do. They do. They totally look like they're shiny bright ornaments. There's like the indent in the middle, the teardrop with the indent. Um, it's not, there's no, um, 
there's no like label or anything on it, but this was clearly a manufactured handkerchief because it's got the ribbing and stuff along the edges. I just don't know if the actual embroidery was, I think it was machine done because if you do my little trick, that's the front of it. The back of it looks almost identical. So I think that this is just a machine made piece, but I thought it was kind of sweet, just a small size and it's only decorated on that one little corner. So that one came from, I want to say it was a Christian um, thrift store family something. And there were several of them up route 35. Like they had huge billboards. They had five on 35. They had five different branches of this store um, on Interstate 35 heading up toward Duluth. So can't remember the name of it was, um, but it was like a Goodwill, you know, like a Salvation Army. It was kind of structured the same way. Um, the price tags, I couldn't really tell any if they were color coded in any way. So I'm not sure if that's, you know, doing anything. No worries, Susan. We we're just hanging out. Nothing, nothing important is uh, is going on. Um, so, oh, sorry, Deb. Yeah, so I was in Minnesota for several days uh, up through, well, actually most of the week. I got there on Monday, left on Friday, uh, but then from Duluth, I spent most of the day because it took about seven hours to drive home. Um, most of the day was driving through Wisconsin. So those are a couple Christmassy things. This was also a Christmas item that I got at the at one of the garage sales. So it has this cool little box with an old uh, Christmas stamp on it. But inside, it's a manufactured piece, manufactured, contemporarily manufactured by a place ingeniously named Two Women San Francisco. So this little tag was in here and it's still wrapped. Um, yeah, it is, it's, still, it's still got the wrap to it. So this was never used. So it's a little, it's like a, it's a modern picture frame that was made, but you can see what they did to the border is they took vintage Christmas stamps, canceled Christmas stamps and used those to make the frame. So it probably doesn't matter because the frame clearly is modern. You know, this is something that probably has been made within the last 10 years but you could probably date the stamps by when were per, when was first class postage 22 cents. I have no idea. I have not looked that up yet. Um, it's way more than that now, but I have no recollection hey. of like, when did, like when you sent your Christmas cards out, when was it 22 cents? Like, would that be 80s, 90s? I can't imagine it'd be within the 2000. I can't imagine we've doubled in two years or in 10, in 20 years, but yeah, you know, it's one of those things I can definitely research it. I just, I haven't done it yet because I haven't figured out how to do everything else. I'm still learning lyrics to a song I'm supposed to perform this weekend. Um, so that's one of the things. What were you going to say? Do you know what the postage rates, Katie? Have you done research into that kind of stuff? Let's say that that's something I need to look up. Because now I'm curious, but I don't think that those would be 90s. I think they've got to be at least probably like 70s or 80s. You think it'd be going that far back? Yeah, I don't know. Because I, I remember I had the postcards in the sale on Thursday. And in some of those, like the, the, the postcard postage changed somewhere in like the 40s or early 50s. It changed from one cent to two cents. And so at that time, I want to save postage, first class postage. Just remember looking at the chart. I want to say that was maybe 12, maybe, maybe 15. So yeah, actually, I, you might be right. Maybe this is getting into the 70s. I mean, what's actually showing, you can see the font. You know, just there's nothing really screaming about it that like, I don't know, the, the poinsettias. Yeah, that'd be like a 50s thing. Okay, so Tiger, I, I figured somebody was going to jump to into the internet. I if I babbled long enough, somebody would look it up. Um, so Tiger wins the race, said so that it would have been from 85 to 88. And Daniel was right behind and said 1985. And then Susan uh, found it uh, in 87. So we're in the range of 85 to 88 was when stamps were 22 cents. So we are like legitimately vintage stamps. But again... The box, I'm assuming this was all sold together. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I would think that these, and, be, and it's based on this little hang tag thing. I just don't think they're that old. 
because just the way these little cards are made, you know, again, this may be 2000s, you know, maybe it's 10 years old, maybe even 20 years old. I just thought it's cool. And again, picked it up at a, um, picked it up at a garage sale. And I'm just like, okay, that's cool. And those, that's literally all the Christmas that I got. I'm planning to do a Christmas in July sale at some point. Uh, what's currently listed on my eBay auction is the Better Homes and Garden 1957 Christmas issue. And that's already had nine bids on it. So that's been very popular. Um, you know, so that's kind of a Christmas in July offering. I have plenty of other Christmas. I just didn't get anything on the strip. Um, but I actually just saw over on the side. Um, all right, so we're, now we're getting into the details. Everyone's racing. So Tiger came back with the specifics. So it's February of 85 to April 3rd of 1988. And I find some of that stuff is interesting too, because like um, five digit zip codes were introduced in 1963, but they weren't introduced January 1st. They were introduced later into the year. So there are still things that are done in 63 that don't have a five digit zip code simply because it hadn't been adjusted yet. And even afterwards, there was like a transition period and people needed to update their you know, return addresses and update their brochures for businesses. But 63 is always a nice little um, cutting off point. So then Sherry echoed it February of 85. Um, so yeah, see, it's great. The hive mind is a wonderful thing because you don't think you need to know this information until you've got something like that going, okay, clearly this is made from old material. Well, how old? And that's literally the only way to trace it because it's on a completely modern piece, but they're old stamps. Well, luckily they didn't cut the 22 off. So we know exactly how old those stamps are now. So now that they have any value, cause it looks like they're all cut in half. <laughs> so no stamp collector is going to be wanting this unless it's just for decorative purposes. Hey, Boodle. Thanks for joining. Museums that I've been to is the national postal museum in DC. And they've oh, I've never been to that one. It's relatively, I, I think, newer, and, you know, they've revamped it a lot. And when you go in there, they have a whole history of stamps, and it's absolutely fascinating. And they have stamps from all around the world, but the cool feature is, is you can go onto their website if you look up the Postal Museum, and you can look up any stamp that was ever made. So if you have a stamp that you're trying to figure out about, you can use their research tool on their website. And while you're in the museum, you can go to their website and look through all the stamps and then pick ones that you want to collect. And they'll, at the museum, they'll email you the pictures of them and then you can go hunting for them. But if you really want a fabulous story, go look up the Flying Jenny stamp because there's a whole story about how it got misprinted. And Is that the one that's a plane that's flying upside down? Flying upside down. So that will be some fun homework for all of you stamp collectors out there. So what was it called again? The flying? Flying Jenny. Jenny, like J-E-N-N-Y or J-I-N-N-Y? J-E-N-N-Y. Yes, the stamp was misprinted upside down. And I think that there's only like three now in existence in the whole world. And one of the guys that was trying to collect it, the post office actually tried to take it away from him when he went in to buy the misprint when he heard about it. And somehow he was able to sneak out with just a few. And so he was one of the only people to get them, you know, before the post office realized it and then took them away. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, it's one of those cases, like, the, I, I'm trying to think why I even know that. I want to say it's from a movie. There was, there's a uh, Cary Grant, Audrey Hepburn movie called, I think it's the, I think that one's the uh, one called Charade. And there's like this whole thing where there's, it's two of the world's most valuable stamps. And so like there's a, this whole mob action of trying to like find these stamps. And I want to say they do like a little bit of a backstory about like the value of the stamps. So I think it's, and I, I want to say it's the Penny Black. Is, yeah. the, is that, that's the very first stamp that was ever issued. So that was with Queen Victoria's profile on it and it cost a penny. And that's even something because I've now been, I have so many postcards that I'm trying to process and go figure out how I'm going to sell them. The postcards were able to be sent for a penny for like over 50 years. They just never changed the rate of how much it costs, at least in the United States, to send a, send a postcard. So I have postcards in this collection that I picked up that are from before 1910 
they are all, they all have penny stamps on them. Uh, and wow. then I got all the way into like the forties and the fifties and they were still at a penny. And it was like, not until the fifties that I saw things were changing to two cents. And then it very rapidly went up. Then it went to three cents. It went to four, you know, so it stayed, I don't know if artificially low, like, I don't know how they could have been sending mail worldwide for a penny, um, yeah. but they were able to do it. And speaking worldwide, we've got the the later Nate, the secondary Nate, the less, uh, I don't want to call me lesser Nate, but the uh, Aussie Nate uh, coming in, Drifter Thrifters uh, coming in from Australia. So on the other side of the world. I uh, had Poodle was saying hi earlier, and I'd mentioned I had stuff on the dog front. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit. I did pick up some items in uh, on this trip. They were dog related, not many. Um, so I'm going to do some of these are going to end up out of order, but uh, two items I got. One was from a the garage sale, and it's just a little dog mug. I liked it because it had the bone on the inside, and then another on the back. Sorry, did uh, I, the minute I started saying lesser Nate, I felt that that was probably inappropriate. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Aussie Nate. Um, so that that will go into maybe a mystery box or just kind of, I don't know how I'll sell that because technically I don't even know if that's a breed like that's that that would be for the the mud, the mudables you know that's just people that like dogs it's very cute and it's actually uh, it's Rose of England which I'd never heard of but it's an English porcelain mug it's actually a nice high quality mug so I picked that up. And then this is the other thing that I've been doing. Pretty much anytime I buy something that has a dog on it, I'm pretty much allocating that to get pushed over into the uh, fundraiser. So this one is a little uh, trade card, and I will be having a deep dive next month in August with SF Box. Uh, Mark from SF Box, he'll be talking about Victorian trade cards. So I'll have this available. Uh, what's interesting about this one is I picked this up. This I picked up in Wisconsin, but it's actually advertising um, a company that is near where my daughter went to school here in Illinois. Gail Borden uh, in Elgin, Illinois. There's the Gail Borden Library. You know, the company that that family, you know, did had a lot of philanthropic works. So I picked it up in Wisconsin, but it's actually a trade card for condensed milk from Gail Borden uh, Eagle brand. And this is when they were based in, had moved to Chicago. So this is probably a little bit later. I'll have to, I'll have to look up the research of the company. But it's got a little, little dog basically stealing the milk from the baby that's fallen asleep next to him. So I just thought that was sweet. Um, so that is going to go into the fundraiser. That's a darling part. And they still make equal. I have some. Hand. I'm sorry, I've got you turned down so we don't have any reverb, so I missed what you said. What did you say, Katie? They still have Eagle brand milk. Today I have some condensed milk in my pantry, and of course, I think that's just darling. And I'll be honest, I don't think I knew that Eagle brand and Gail Borden were the same or were related. I mean, there's still Borden milk. When I go to the grocery store, I can still buy Borden milk. Now, I don't know if that's just a local thing, um, or if they still ship that, or if that's like a brand that has uh, followed going through. Yeah. Uh, this one is saying the card is copyrighted in really, really, really small print. It looks like it's 1891 was when the card was copyrighted. So, mm -hmm. and I guess, so what Mark is going to talk about is Victorian trade cards. So technically copyright 1891, we're in the realm of Victoria, even though we're on this side of the pond. Um, so that'll fall in. So that'll be part of the, the fundraiser. If you're joining the sale and you have no, hey, Nancy, if you're joining the sale and you have no idea uh, what I'm talking about, um, I'm sorry, this isn't a sale. If you're joining this channel and you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, last November, uh, so November of 2020, in the middle of uh, the pandemic, we ended up uh, with uh, Dawn uh, Schankweiler, who thought it was neat. Uh, Sean, Dawn Schankweiler uh, and I did a fundraiser for the Just One More Docs and Rescue organization. And if you happen to be following currently, if you're following Kim from Oh My Vintage, 
we did as part of the fundraiser, I sold a bunch of things on my one of my evening sales and all the money that was collected went to the fundraiser. But the other thing we had happened was 35 uh, friends of the channel as well as other resellers donated mystery boxes that all went to one winner. And the winner was Kim from Oh My Vintage. So if you've been watching her channel every month or so, she'll do a, a video showing uh, unboxing of these mystery boxes that she received. Between the mystery box, selling tickets for the mystery box and selling the items, we raised $3,500 for the Just One More Docs and Rescue organization. So this year our goal is to top that. And I've kind of been pushing people off for a while, but we're now at the point, it is still five months away. It'll still, it'll be in November. We haven't set the specific date yet, but it'll be in November. But we're getting to that point where if you would like to support the fund, the fundraiser through a donation of items, we're going to be running it a little bit differently this year. We'll still do the, uh, we're, we're still going to do the mystery boxes, but this time we're not going to say all mystery boxes go to one person. Uh, again, for people that were aware of it back at the time, I, we had no idea how much support was going to be behind this. I had reached out to a handful of the resellers that I knew and even the ones that I knew, I wasn't sure if they'd want to do it because like, they're just, they're giving away stuff. You know, so it was one of those like, Hey, it's a charity. You could get a 501c3 and get a donation or a, like a letter as a donation. You know, do you want to do this? And so when we started promoting it, we said, you know, buy tickets. And you know, we don't know how many boxes we'll get, but I had commitments at that time. We started to get around 10. So I said, you know, you'll get at least 10 mystery boxes in this great, you know, you got this great opportunity for just buying a $5 raffle ticket. You know, you get this chance to win. And then people started hearing about it and suddenly it was 15 and then it was 20 and then it was 25. And we got to a point where all of us were like, okay, this is nuts because if all of these boxes go to one person, they're going to be completely inundated with who knows what. But by that time, we'd already done the promotions. We'd already said, if you bought a raffle ticket, you would get all of the boxes. So I didn't feel right changing the rules. So we ended up at 35. So that's how many that Kim got. This year, we'll probably change it. And maybe, you know, we'll do like five or 10, whatever, we'll, we'll figure it out. So people can donate mystery boxes. The nice thing about those is I don't have to deal with shipping them. You just say you're going to, you're going to commit to doing it. I will hold you to that because we're doing something this year for everyone who participates. So if, once you commit to it, you will be held to be committed to this. Um, we will then pick the winner and then I send all the, the donors, I send you the address of the person that won mm -hmm. and you just drop ship the box. So you still, the, you know, the, the resellers still have to donate the items. They still have to pay for the shipping, but I'm not in the middle of it. And I will be selling items both in the live sale and I'll be selling a lot of items on the eBay channel, on my eBay channel, just to try and cover more ground. So all of that was to preface why I've got the two things I'm purchased for the sale, but then I also got a shipment from Annette Fain, also from Illinois, uh, who donated a little golden retriever uh, packet package. So it doesn't have to be all about doxies. You know, we want all dog lovers to participate in the fundraiser. And this box was in my, uh, in my friend mailbox when I got home and it's this little, uh, it's like still sealed up. You know, you see these at bookstores or art craft fairs or things like that. It's just a little drawing of a golden retriever in a little oval mat, probably five by seven, maybe four by six, no, probably five by seven. Five by seven. Also a cool little golden retriever candy tin. Just a nice short little candy tin. He uses a sewing tin or use put candy in it as well as a golden retriever's book. So she's got this little book. I think it might've come from the library at some point, but it's still in really nice condition. And it's got some cute pictures of golden retrievers in there. And then just information about, you know, are they good pets? How to train them? What they're good at doing, what they're not doing. So what I did last year and I'll probably do again this year is as I get donations across multiple breeds, these will make up most of the live sale packages and I'll kind of like combine things together. So I'll have a golden retriever basket. I'll have a Rottweiler basket. You know, in some cases we had breeds that only had one or two donations. Others we had to have multiple baskets because they got really popular. So uh, these are all, I, all donations are, appreciated. 
Uh, like I said, some of them will go into the eBay channel. Some will be sold live on the sale. I don't do, uh, for those who are not familiar with my channel, I do not do auctions or offer ups in my live sales. So if there's something that I think might, you know, make more money, there's, I've already had a couple really, really valuable items donated to me. Those will probably go into eBay so that they can get the highest dollar amount possible. So because it is a fundraiser. So it'll be just kind of a combination of everything. And uh, uh, Katie has already donated a, a great stack of, um, I can't remember the names now, but there were two different sets of bandanas that she had purchased specifically for Louie, um, but that there was a reason that Louie wasn't gonna be able to wear them. So, but they're in great condition and they're, they've got the little tag from the two companies. Do you remember who they were? One is Lucy and Company, and the other one, I don't remember the company now, but they make really good, like, kind of higher-end quality dog bandanas, and they're just cute, you know? Yeah, the one was, like, they're all kind of like a plaid flannel, and then the others had really nice, and they were a lot, the, the one that we can't remember the name of, but they were really thick, uh, like Rocco and something. Yeah. Yes, Rocco and Company. There you go. Um, so they were, like, really thick, high-quality, double-sided um, so those will be some somehow offered. I'm not sure if we're going to do them as sets uh, or if we're going to you know, do. I, I don't know what we're going to do with those. But um, yeah, so Katie has offered those. So that was that was the a gift from Louis. Uh, so Louis the pug is not upset that money is being raised for a series of dachshunds. Uh, mm -hmm. Dawn, you know, oh. should give us an update on. I think she just. I know recently she rescued another dog, and I want to say there's a. Oh, there we go. I'm rescuing another pup in the morning. So last I heard, she had rescued 31, but I want to say that was before the one you just got. So that maybe you're at 32 and this one would be 33, but I can't remember the numbers anymore. But um, the dogs that she gets are, uh, a lot of them have medical issues. They've been, they basically are being given up by their owners because of medical issues. Uh, so she has a lot of senior dogs that she takes. So number 32. Uh, that she takes in and make sure even if like there have been dogs, if you, you really want to just completely be depressed, go to the Just One More Dogs and Red website and look at all the immemorium ones. Um, there were dogs that she's rescued that she didn't even, one dog she could only have for a day. You know, so it's like even just making sure that their last day is as, is as uh, meaningful and uh, that they, they have, um, can't think of the term I'm trying to think of, like not humanity because they're dogs, but like that they, they're treated well, um, that, uh, yeah. So she is, she is a, just an angel on us on this earth, taking care of all these dogs. Um, there are a couple of videos when I visited her back in May, um, they're hilarious. Yeah. So, and even some of the older ones are still pretty frisky, but she does have some younger ones as well. Um, so yeah, so she's, she's definitely taking care of, so everyone's, everyone is sending their love Don, uh, cause you are doing definitely a great work, uh, specifically for the geriatric dogs. All those dogs need so much love and Dawn, and I'm glad that we've got people like you that do that kind of thing, uh, cause they really need it. Yeah. But in some cases, those dogs are coming with thousands of dollars of medical bills to get teeth pulled, to get eye surgeries, to get liver thing, uh, just all kinds of stuff. So we raised $3,500 last year. And I think the next dog she raised at something like $6,000 in medical bills. So it's kind of like, okay, I was really excited to raise 3,500 bucks and it didn't even cover the next medical bill that came in, but it all, it all comes together. It all helps. And, uh, it was, uh, you can show humanity to an animal. It's about your actions as a human. Okay. So it still was, I'm still not trying to think, I'm still trying to think the word I was trying to think of was basically that they, that they die with um, dignity. That's what I was trying to come up with, not humanity, dignity, that they, you know, that they're, even if it is only a short period of time that they're, they should, they know that they're loved and that they're in a safe home. And I think you now have two dogs that have vision problems and, and hearing problems. So, you know, you've got, you know, making sure that they feel safe in that, that environment. So yes, so the fundraiser will come back again. Uh, so it'll be in November. I don't know if I've updated my notes on this one, but if you look at some of my other videos, that's got my friend mail. If you do want to donate anything, 
It doesn't have to be dog related. Uh, probably the non dog related things will be pushed on to uh, the eBay store just so we can cover more ground. And I will also say as I show things in haul videos like this, um, I'm actually invoicing somebody right now for one of the items I showed in the previous haul because I'm happy to sell items in advance because I don't, it, it gives me more time to sell stuff later. I just set the money aside and then that'll still go to the fundraiser. So if you ever see something like if you, if you like some of the items, if they're going to go to auction, I probably won't do it. Um, but if it's just a, a standard and you just think it's cute and you want to support the fundraiser, reach out to me and then we'll be putting a lot more specifics once we have the date and how we're going to sell the tickets. Um, because one of the things we're going to do, and I haven't figured out how to do this yet, but one of the things I, I bought these specifically, if you're familiar, if you've been watching my channel, um, I've developed a new fascination with um, these basically gaming devices that are called punch boards. Uh, this one's more of a punch card. I ended up buying three identical ones. So one of them is going to stay in my personal collection. Um, but what I like about the, the ones that I like the most are the ones that actually, they're still technically gambling. So I have to be very careful how I do this. I don't want to get myself in trouble. And I certainly don't want to get the, uh, the charity in trouble. Um, so I need, you know, there are issues about whether these get used because they can be viewed as gambling uh, because some of them, are gambling but this one you can see right on there everyone wins something and so i'm playing around with the idea is i can't really do much if it's a penny um but is that maybe you end up buying uh there are 100 squares on this card and the way it's designed is it's designed for candy and so um everybody gets one piece of candy and then so you know, even if you don't get one of the bonus, you at least get one piece of, piece of candy. But if you have the number five, you get 20 pieces of candy. If you get numbers 10 through 15, you get 10 pieces of candy. So there's a way to get more than just the minimum. So I'm trying to play with an idea and I got to make sure I talk to Dawn and we do, we are not breaking any laws because this can't be considered gambling. Uh, but maybe we'll do something where you're guaranteed something. But if you get one of those cards, maybe you'll get more. So I haven't figured out, it can't be cash. It will not be cash, won't be cash, uh, but you'll give me cash, but maybe we'll figure out, I, I still have a lot of Wade Whimsies. So that's kind of one of my thoughts is that maybe if you get one Wade Whimsy, but you could get 20 Wade Whimsies, you know, just kind of, a, I haven't decided. So if you have any ideas, I definitely take them um, because I just, I like the fact that you would, everyone's gonna win something. I don't want it to just be, we hope you do want to donate to the charity, but because I don't want this to be viewed as gambling, I want everyone to be able to get something, but then you will have the opportunity of doing even more. Um, and raffles in Illinois are actually really strictly regulated. So I have to also be careful about what I'm doing, even for something as simple as a raffle. Um, I do, and the reason I know that is because I work with community theaters and they are typically doing raffles. You actually need a license to hold a raffle. Um, most people don't. And if it's for a charity, it's unlikely anyone's going to come chasing after me. But if it was just me, that's one set of rules. But as I'm trying to do this on behalf of a charity, we don't want to put the charity at risk. So it's, there's going to be, there has to be some way to do it, but we just need to make sure that, you know, we're all on board. <laughs> we're like, we're going to do something and we're going, cause we want it to be fun. We want people to participate and do, you know, the, the, uh, mystery boxes was far more popular than I have even anticipated. And I think to a certain extent, because it got to the point where, well, heck for five bucks, you were getting a chance to win. I, it was 34 up until the day, the night of the show. And then the 35th reseller said, wait, I wasn't on your list. I, I wanted to do one too. And I did not have that information. So it ended up being 35. So we raised, I can't remember how we split it, but it was more than, I think half, if not more than half of the money was from the raffle. Uh, and then the rest of it was selling items. And again, selling items without being an auction, without being like that was just selling things at what was a fair price. We can now put some stuff onto the eBay, you know, site. And so maybe some of those items will start getting more, a little bit more, you know, because a couple of people said, oh, you should have done it as an auction. You would have made more money on some of the more popular items. But I have to sell everything. I have to because people are donating them to me for the fundraiser. If they don't sell, what am I supposed to do with it? It's not mine, it's the charity. So we had, uh, I think uh, Dawn ended up getting a box of some of the stuff that people bought, but then they didn't really want it. They were just buying it to, 
give the money. So then I had to ship all that stuff done. So then we lost money, you know, because I was saying paying to ship, I think the box was like 40 pounds of stuff that I sent so that she could then give it away in raffles and things that she does throughout the year. Cause the, the charity is based in Maryland. Uh, so you're on the East coast, you know, definitely can uh, reach out and support her locally. Um, but we're going to do this nationwide and, uh, we're going to see what we can do. So anyway, so yes, yeah, so we'll do it. We'll do the, some sort of a game, have ideas, whatever we call it, whatever we can do. If anybody's a lawyer, <laughs> yeah, if anybody's got ideas on how to make sure we're not breaking any laws, uh, that would be great. But I appreciate Annette Fain for br sending out the uh, golden retriever package. I've already received other donations. I've shown some of them before. Michelle Decker has donated quite a few. Michelle Decker has donated a couple of really valuable items already, like to the tune of when I did the research, I went back to her and said, um, did you know what you donated? <laughs> because this is worth a lot of money. And she's like, no, she's cleaning out her father's estate. And if she didn't want it, it was coming to me as first dibs or it was going to go to Goodwill. So, um, so there will be a couple of really nice items that will be in available in uh, for that as well. Hey, Nate's coming in. So we got, we, okay, we're not going to go greater, lesser Nate's. We're going to Nate the original. See, secondary Nate seems pretty bad for the Aussie Nate as well. So we've got Kiwi Nate and Aussie Nate. I don't know. What, what did we determine? We were trying to tell them each. Kiwi Nate and Aussie Nate. I like Kiwi that. Nate and Aussie Nate. Okay. That, that, they can decide which one of them is then the superior Nate. You know, is, Kiwi, is, is New Zealand better than Australia? Is Australia better than New Zealand? I'm sure there's a very long-standing uh, argument about that. But uh, um, it's called Drifter Nate. Hi, other. <laughs> And I'm happy to help Poodle. I, 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 all the people that have dogs, I know that uh, Dawn is in a fairly rural area. So hopefully she doesn't have a lot of uh, fireworks and firecrackers and stuff going on. But I know that here in the suburbs of Chicago, when I had dogs, 4th of July was miserable. I, the, you know, just the dog. I don't know how does Louis, Louis can't handle the sprinklers. I can't imagine Louis can handle 4th of July. Oh, she goes a little nuts. She starts barking. And I don't know that she's scared, per se, of the fireworks. So she's used to the thunder and all the storms we get here. I think she's just like, what is this noise? And she'll go just barking and howling. So when I left, before I came to dinner, I decided to turn on the TV. And so what's playing right now while I'm gone is a very long Hallmark movie. With <laughs> Louie like, likes her rom-coms. <laughs> hey, there's just a nice, calm voice in the background for Louie <laughs> until I get back. So that's interesting. So, Susan, you, your fireworks were last night. That's interesting. I mean, because technically today's the 4th, but I think most companies and, like, I was just looking it up because I needed to make – I wasn't – we just changed uh, garbage service for the town, and everyone's debating whether this counts as a holiday – that we do, most people get Monday off. So I don't know why you would need to do your, your fireworks on Saturday night, unless there's a lot of communities competing to do their fireworks. Then you might, I guess I could see maybe spreading them out. Uh, that's interesting. You did yours on a, on a Saturday. So here they have 10 different locations around the city, all going off at, at 945 tonight. Oh, wow. On right across from where I live at the mall, they're doing a big fireworks display. The city will have the you have all, you know, like Jack's Beach, Atlantic Beach, Bernardina Beach, you know, and the list just goes on and on. And then, of course, neighbors always shoot off fireworks. You know, you're not supposed to shoot off city grade fireworks, but, you know, everyone does. So I'll be. Well, I think um, Illinois, there's like certain types that are allowed, but for the most part, fireworks in Illinois are illegal. And I don't know all the different requirements across all the different states, but what I I have to assume is at least Minnesota's restrictions must be less than Wisconsin's, Illinois, maybe even Iowa, because what I discovered was every place when I was anywhere near the border, they were just huge places set up to sell the fireworks, you know, so people could cross the cross the state line, get all their illegal fireworks, then come back, which you're not supposed to do, but you know, it makes them available. Um, so like there, I know you can do bottle rockets, you can do firecrackers. There's certain things you can do yeah. in Illinois, but it's, the threshold's pretty low, like city grade, totally not. Like you're not doing the, the ginormous, you know, sunburst type stuff. Like those are clearly not, but I think the threshold is, is pretty, pretty, pretty low. Um, that I think Minnesota's might be a little bit, a little bit lesser. Um, 
want to have anything that shoots up in the sky here. You can do snake bombs and sparklers and that kind of thing. But if it goes up in the sky, but there's a loophole because people can come down from North Carolina where it's legal, sell fireworks at the fireworks stands on private property. And because it's on private property, the city and, and the police cannot do anything about it. So there's this whole oh. how people are getting the city grade fireworks. Because all these tents are popping up all over the city, people can go get them. But technically, I mean, you can do a whole bunch of research and legalities, but there is some sort of a loophole, and that's how people shoot off fireworks here. The biggest thing, because my dad was a cop, you know, as when I was growing up, and well, first of all, that meant we had the best illegal fireworks. But um, the way that they were kind of trying to enforce it at that point, because if you're shooting a firework, the, the evidence really isn't there anymore. <laughs> like it's gone. Um, they could get you on noise ordinance because I have to say, I don't hear them as much as I did when I was a kid. So maybe there's been other regulations, but what were the, what were the ones that were like the, the basically like the small bombs? I want to say M80, oh. but I don't think that's right. Um, no, there's a name for them. Uh, but I don't know what the name is. But yeah, yeah, so that those were very, very common growing up. So it wasn't there was no there was no light, there was no color. There it literally was just loud. But they were super, super popular because I grew up in a rural area of Illinois. And there's okay, so Bria is saying they are M80s. That's like that's kind of what I remembered they were called of the M80s. But then I'm like, wait, is that a gun? Um, so yeah, so M80, the sole purpose is to just make ridiculously loud bang. And so those were something, okay, or Nancy's saying quarter sticks. We were not, to my knowledge, no one was handling dynamite, um, but that's effectively what those little cher oh, cherry bombs, somebody just said cherry bombs too. Uh, so that that was, a, I think those were actually smaller. I think the M80s were a little bit larger, but they were, they were small. And so you could you know light it and then throw it, uh, theoretically throw it before it went off. Um, but, uh, they were just really loud and I just don't know what the attraction was. Bottle rockets we had, those were like firecrackers attached to like a stick mm -hmm. that had like kind of like a little rock on the top so that it was, I think, I don't remember how they went off, but somehow you'd get the burst of air to get it airborne and then it popped once it was in the air. So again, it was really, I, it was just, it was equivalent. You're right, Pat. It was equivalent because it was just for the noise. Bottle rockets didn't do any sort of light. Um, we had those snake things that you were talking about. They looked, they looked like the little miniature like hockey pucks that you set on fire and it just like shot out this weird black ash thing. Um, I guess Nate probably is the wrong person to ask. I can't imagine they're celebrating Fourth of July. <laughs> you know, they're they're still under colonial oppression. Um, but but we uh, had the big fireworks because my dad lived in South Carolina at the time, and it was legal. And he would take us to my stepmom's uh, sister had a farm, and we'd go up to the farm. And dad, dad was very safe about everything because he hunted and camped and was big on safety and everything. But we would get these big fireworks. And dad, dad would light them and shoot them off. And the, and he let us do all kinds of things. My mom probably had, she known would have been like, that's dangerous. But dad was like, we'll teach him safety and it will be fine. So we shot off all kinds of fireworks in the back of the truck. <laughs> I could hear some going off last night that were definitely local. They were not the city ones. I don't even know if I don't, I mean, I live in such a small community. I don't think we technically have our own, but the neighboring town, like they do fundraisers throughout the year to buy and you can see them from all over, but they were, you could just, and again, even when they have lights, they still have that bang, you know, attached to them. And I still, I just, I have this post-traumatic thing with the dogs that like every dog we had just hated them so much that half of our 4th of July's were spent in the basement, you know, with a TV blaring, like just try everything to distract. I remember it came up in my Facebook, um, one of the, like the flashback or Facebook, whatever they, you know, seven years ago, um, it was a picture of our miniature schnauzer that we got a, uh, what's it called? A thunder shirt or thunder jacket, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it worked the way it was supposed to. Basically, we put it on the dog and the dog stood there frozen for like 15 minutes. Like, 
Yeah, I don't think this is calming the dog. <laughs> I think we've just totally freaked out the dog. So, uh, you know, you just never, you never know. And unfortunately, some people don't care. You know, they're having, they're there to have fun. Um, and that's, I get that. But then it's like when you start breaking the law to have fun and now you're also annoying me, you know, so like we never called the cops on our neighbors. It, it figured it is what it is. But um, yeah. The fireworks at like four in the morning. That's where I have, uh, to have a problem because we have a neighborhood. So my apartment complex backs up to like a man-made retention pond. Then behind that, there's a whole subdivision back there out in the kind of out in the woods. And they have all this land. And so they shoot off city grade fireworks. Now it's kind of cool in the evening when you can sit on your porch and get a free show. But it, they'll, they'll go to like four or five in the morning. And then they have four wheelers where they're out on the four wheeler driving around and yelling. <laughs> it's really loud. And I think our building, people have said they've called the cops before because it's just so like at four in the morning at that point, you're like, come on, man. I want to go to bed. <laughs> well, and the other thing that you get through, and I, I had the comment up short, briefly, and now I can't find it again, so I can't remember who put it, but it was somebody in Arizona that you also have, the, it's not as much of an issue, I think, maybe in Florida, not so much in Illinois, but, you know, in Arizona, some of the, the really dry climates, you know, you've got heat and humidity, you suddenly have the heat, but no moisture, you suddenly get a firework that goes off or prematurely or doesn't, you know, go in its intended direction, you suddenly start a, you suddenly start a grass fire, you know, you've, you're suddenly burning thousands of acres. And I remember there it is tiger. Um, yeah, because they're, they are legal and yet it's one of the most irresponsible places to do uncontrolled fireworks because of what could legitimately could happen. And it has happened like trying to find people like who set this fire, whether it was an accident or not, you know, you're now responsible for deaths, damage, damage to property, like all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, we got time to take sparklers. Sparkler, probably still dangerous in Arizona, but you know, those those are legal in Illinois. I remember growing up with sparklers. Um, like we're spark, sparklers, uh, firecrackers. Although we were not as kids, we were never allowed to like. Uh, technically, we're not allowed to light them ourselves. You know, the parents had to do that. Um, we did have bottle rockets, which even as a kid, I didn't find those particularly interesting. Um, but, uh, no, the, the, the snakes, the snakes lasted longer. So, and then sparklers lasted longer. So yeah. it was like, there was, you, you could actually hold it and watch it or do whatever. You know, we put it in cakes, cupcakes, whatever that it's like, it, it wasn't like a, literally a flash in a pan that you did it and it was gone. So, um, Fourth of July has never been a and huge celebratory thing for me. So it's uh, not, nothing about the meaning behind it. Just simply, I just don't get the attraction to it. And it's nice to see the fireworks, but it's kind of like once you've seen them once, you know, um, Australia does the cool, like they don't celebrate Fourth of July, but they do all the fireworks at uh, New Year's, you know, they set them off the Sydney, behind the Sydney Opera House, off the Sydney Bridge, you know, that's beautiful and I one and done. I'm good. <laughs> like I don't need to do all that. I love tuning into the New York uh, fireworks because last year they had fireworks. I think it was the first time they were able to do it from the Empire State Building. Oh, so it was on top of the Empire State Building and it, the photographs that people were getting from this, the professional photographers, it was incredible. And you go to Empire State Building, I follow them on Instagram. And they post pictures and it's just some of the, if you love photography in New York, you will just swoon over all of these photos, but they put on a really cool show. Well, I think when we lived in DC, they had started doing a different type of uh, firework display where they incorporated the Washington monument. And it just seemed wholly inappropriate the way they had the fireworks going off. I think it started it for the millennium. Like that was the 2000 fireworks. And it just, it just looked odd <laughs> yeah, as that was erupting, um, but uh, they still do it. So it's, you know, it, it's fun. And if it's nice outside, the problem is again, in Florida, it's gotta be miserable, but even around here, you get the bugs, you get the heat, you get the humidity. 
I, you know, if I, if I could sit on my bed with the window shades open and just stare at something easily, sure, I'll watch them. But for the most part, that's not going to happen. So I'll just look at some pictures on TV. And like you said, some people can get some great shots, way better than anything I'm going to see locally. And I can just enjoy that. So, you know, you never know. So everyone's, everyone's comparing Absolutely. what they're, what they're all doing a month after the fourth. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, the nice thing is here is they they're doing with COVID they've changed a lot. So with fireworks now they're doing a lot of drive up. So you can go to these locations and park, and then you set your radio dial, which is pretty cool to a local radio station that does an awesome program. And they have uh, recordings, old radio recordings, and then uh, you know big band, not modern country Fourth of July stuff, but true old American uh, patriotic music set to the fireworks. So they've worked with some company and they have this show that plays and then you can go and turn your radio dial and sit in your car. So it's kind of nice because it's air conditioned. You get the little music with it and the cool his history with the radio broadcasts and all. And then, you know, you don't have to get out and get eaten by bugs or sweat to death. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I was even like for those that are doing it, I going outside because you know, a lot of people enjoy outdoors that this is you know the time of year and we've all been locked up for a year, you know, so you want to enjoy what you can. Um, I did grab my my I got my new crazy shirt, but I didn't have a fourth of July. I didn't have a red, white, and blue version. So I've got this I've got the surfboards on because you know, heavy duty surfing in Illinois. Uh, so that's, that's, I didn't get an, I didn't get a nod to uh, 4th of July clothing, but I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going outside. Um, there was a 50, 50 chance. I wasn't even going to get dressed today. And then I remembered I was going to do a live chat. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I guess I need to get dressed. <laughs> so you, you got, uh, you got one of my, my, uh, my little crazy shirts, you, my, uh, surfboard shirts. First time I'm wearing it. Um, okay. So we're going to other crazy things. We're talking about different places in the country. Um, so this is I'm going to show a couple more things. I don't want to be on for too much longer because people are going to start getting their uh, fireworks will start here. Get ready for fireworks. So this is one of the things I wanted to show, and one of the re and this is actually, believe it or not, one of the reasons I wanted to do a live chat because first we can make fun of the handicrafts of northern Wisconsin. So we've got this lovely um, crocheted doily. Now what I find odd about it is it's not really flat. It's like ruffled. So I guess you would still be able to put like a candle or something or a hot, like use as a hot plate, but there's definitely ruffling going on here. But this one, it's got the, the burnt orange, the rust, the brown, and then a very vibrant blue running through the middle. So that's just more of a decorative doily. I don't think it's really a hot pad, but this matches it and I can't figure out what it is. So everyone has to figure this out. So this one, it's, tr it's, it's clearly handmade. You can see where the knots were tied off. Like this is somebody sitting on their rocker. This was, this was purchased in uh, Superior, Wisconsin. Um, th somebody was making this. This is the exact same yarn color, just a slightly different design. So these are clearly made at the same time. Why is there a hole in this one? Like legitimately, that's what I'm asking. Why is there a hole? I clearly, I truly, truly, truly do not know why this would have a hole running through the middle of it. So this is going to sound strange because it may be totally a fire hazard, but do you think a candle would have gone through that? Well, I mean, I was thinking maybe if you had like the, like the regular, the, the, like the chamber stick that there's a taper candle. I mean, it's a little small, but yes, you could probably, but then it's kind of like, I don't know why you would need it to cover the candlestick because you could just as easily do like, if you have a candlestick, you just set it in the middle of this one and you would have a, you, it would hold it. So, okay. So Tia Fain's saying a tea cozy. Now my mother used to crochet tea cozies. So this is not a tea cozy that I am familiar with. The ones that she used to do were kind of like, almost picture about four times the size, but then with a kind of a seam down the middle. So it draped on both sides of the teapot. This one's so small. I mean, it's probably only like five or six inches across. It really wouldn't drape over anything. You know, it's like if I, you know, 
it's got something that's of relative size. It's my black light. I mean, it's just, it's, it doesn't do anything pretty. You know, if it drapes down, it doesn't look right. Um, so somebody was saying that they felt that maybe the, with the circular one, the ruffles was, it was not made, they had too many stitches. And that's entirely possible. And I did give them the benefit of the doubt that it was, maybe it was supposed to look stupid. Because if you like take some time, you can actually make the ruffles symmetrical. And this centerpiece is still flat. So I don't know. I do, I do think the ruffles are purposeful. I do think it's, you know, it, it may not be to our aesthetics, but I do think those are by design. I'm just waiting for anyone to say. Nate, Nate was saying possibly um, a doll skirt or like, uh, something for a doll like a poncho and I have seen those uh, little tiny like cupid But that's why I bought both of these because I do think they're designed to go together and they had others that had holes in them as well. Admittedly this is one of the smaller holes and oh wait there's a there's something in it. There is a flexible ring in this. So that hole is predetermined based on oh. this so it's not like a metal ring because I can collapse it. I didn't even realize that there there is rigidity to it. So something they did that on they did that on purpose. Um, and so like I'm thinking, I, so if if this is more for the kitchen, then then maybe this could be what Carrie's saying. You know, maybe the little knob in the top of the of, the, of a pan lid that the knob would be you know, it would be plastic or wood or have something you could catch, but then this would sit against the pan. So as you grabbed it, it your hand wouldn't touch the hot metal. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm liking that Carrie. Um, yeah, so let's I see. Makes sense. let's see if we got any other options. If there's supposed to be a coaster where they be holding it. Yeah. So I don't think it's a, co I wouldn't think it's a coaster. Angela's agreeing with the doll poncho. Um, start off with a tight magic circle but this one is too big so that's a, that's in producing them susan's echoing you on i'm having a candlestick um but and i would i would maybe agree that the person was a beginner but like i said and they may have all come from the same home i don't know there were at least two other styles that weren't in the same color there were at least two other styles where it's like the whole and now that I realize there's something in here, like there's a reason that hole was made. And I'm thinking that's crochet. I don't think that's knitting, but it's very, very loosely done. And it's not very well done. Like that I can only say I've never crocheted. Um, but again, you're, it's not ideal that you sit there and see <laughs> where the knots connect the different colors. Um, yeah. So that's me. They get an A for effort. <laughs> yes. Design element for a flower bouquet. Ooh. Okay. If you had, like, if you picture doing the, the bouquet of like a wedding bouquet where you actually have the flowers gathered into something that would stick through this. God, I hope you wouldn't have it for a wedding, but like maybe <laughs> like a little posy holder or something. All right, so uh, Josie is saying it is crochet. So, okay, so at least right on that. Uh, probably a little too small. I know you're doing the LOL, so it's a little too small for a bracelet. Maybe I, I have a really big ring. Yeah, it's not. It's I still not, think a little Cupid doll could fit down in there with the tiny legs, and it might be the base. But then why would there be a matched one like this? Yeah. That's, that's that the only reason I bought these. I will end up selling these in a sale, or they're just <laughs> going to end up in somebody's mystery box. I, I really bought these because it truly, I need, I wanted to know, like, I really want to know why <laughs> you would have that thing. because my mother crocheted, like she did stuff all the time. She did those, she did all of the, and I still see them at the flea market, those tea towels where you take the towel, you cut it in half and then you stitch the top of it, you know, gather it up and then hook it over a, uh, like a drawer handle or your, or your oven handle. You know, so you have, I, she made those while I was growing up. Those have been around for a long time. So she used to crochet all the time. She, to my knowledge, she never did anything like that. 
So Carrie's saying I should put it into Delbert's mystery box. <laughs> so, we don't know. So it's just a, just a hot pad. Yeah, this the problem that I think with this one, I'd have to look, is if I grab something really big, I don't know if it would sit flat. Like, because of those because ruffles, of I'm not sure if it needs to be something small that just sits in the middle of the ruffles because... Yeah, if, if I try and put something big on it, the ruffles kind of get caught underneath it and it makes it kind of rocky. I'm putting this on it because this is this was my this was my big piece, my big purchase from this trip. Um, so going back into that, this came from Wisconsin. So did this. However, this originated. So this is for Delbert. This is for um, who else? Right? Who are my Buckeyes in the house? Uh, this actually is a 19th century piece of decorated stoneware from Middlebury, Ohio. So 1850 to 1875 is from what I can research when uh, A. De Haven was doing it. Um, so I was taking this size and trying to put it underneath the pad and it, it doesn't it doesn't sit right because the ruffles kind of bug, bubble under. So I think the idea would be it would be the size of the orange piece so like a candle or something would sit on there and then the little ruffles just like look decorative but so those were the weird crochet this was the piece i was super excited to bring home so this one it, i admittedly when i saw middlebury i thought middlebury was in vermont <laughs> it's not well it is but this one is from middlebury uh, ohio so i don't have any ohio uh, stoneware in my collection, at least not signed. So I was really excited to pick that up. And that came from Prox Crocs and Antiques, which is one of the big names for decor uh, decorated stoneware. And I didn't even realize I was going to be driving through where Prox Crocs is located because it's about five and a half hours from where I am. So I've never even considered going there because it's just, it's just too far away. But because of that weird geography, when I was going from Duluth to come down into Illinois, I ended up going basically through Northern Wisconsin and all of a sudden I was within like, I basically the road I was on, he was about two miles off that road. So thank you for Google search because I was just looking for antique stores. There were not many of them. I did a bunch of them up in, in Superior, if you're ever in Northern Wisconsin up near Duluth, Minnesota, there's one street in Superior, Wisconsin where there was four or five, two antique stores, a thrift store, and a consignment store. Um, antique stores I didn't find as, as much, but I found stuff in the other places. And uh, then I drove like an hour and there was nothing, like nothing was on the map. So I didn't have any place to go. And then I found uh, Prox Crocs. So I was really excited to get that. So I, will, I did actually grab some video uh, at Prox Crocs, but I didn't have a chance to process it in time uh, yesterday to get it up posted today. So. Again, we're just doing this as a little live chat, a little bit of a live haul. Um, yeah, so just great clothes for a wedding. <laughs> so, you know, we've got it. We've got an odd little mix. Oh, it looks like Vinny joined us. I didn't see Vinny come in. So, hey, Vinny. Hey, um, Vinny. And we've got, oh, now I've got, it's been a while. Um, Tim and Jerry, Jim and Jerry. What, what do we got? Tim and Jerry, you guys. Tim and Jerry, okay. I, mean, like we're, I knew we are like some variation off of Tom and Jerry. I just couldn't remember what the variation was. So either Tim or and or Jerry, probably Jerry, uh, joining in the chat. So, hey, uh, welcome. Um, let's see. said hi to some of the other people. Oh, Michelle Lee. Don't think I said hi to Michelle. So, hi, Michelle. Um, so, apologize if I it missed anybody. It's loud here, folks. Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, no, you're good. We're, I, we're gonna, I wanna highlight a couple things and then like, we're just hanging out. We've got one thing I want to show. Oh, actually, a couple of things. Somebody, I think Nancy, um, I saw in the chat, but I didn't see the whole thing. Nancy, you were talking something about scouts. And um, I picked this up. So Martha's here too. I picked up an album. I'm going to talk to Katie. I'm going to talk about albums. Now, this one, Katie's going, to, Katie's going to laugh at me because I didn't ask Katie, I just, I bought this without her approval. <laughs> so she will be able to mock me later. Um, but this is the Girl Scouts Sing Around the World. And so it's got the Girl Scouts uh, uh, emblem on it. It is a 33. Um, 
kind of got the globe with all the dull faces. It is, I did figure it out. I don't know if I figured out the exact year, but I did go ahead and pick it up because it has the address for the um, Girl Scouts or whoever published this. It's got the two digit zip code. So this is from between 1948 and 1963. So it's just one of those weird little statistic things that I like when it has the shorter zip code because it's easier to trace down. Um, it's all horrible Girl Scout music. Um, God, our loving father, a, the Finnish ceremonial song, the sun worshipers, the American Indian rising song, Brungiorno Italian round of greeting, song of the Delhi, Tongawala, Hindustani work song, Oh, kookaburra. We got the kookaburra song for Australia. So I don't know oh, if, if know Aussie Nate is still there. So they, I didn't know the kookaburra song was that old. <laughs> so it predates 1963. Um, Whippoorwill, Lullaby, Walking at Night, which is from a, a Czech walking song. They have walking songs. Um, so I don't know if these are all, I didn't know Girl Scouts were worldwide. Because British, aren't the British ones, they're like, girl guides or something like aren't they aren't in the uk aren't yes, they something different there's something else yeah so i'm yeah, not sure there's... how these are all girl scout songs but it's, it says right in there the girl scout songs uh words can be found in your girl scout songbooks so sing together girl scout pocket songbook and the ditty bag um i just thought this was fun and i mean i have no idea if it plays it's just a single disc but I just thought the graphics on it were kind of cool. Unfortunately, Mrs. Yeah. Knutson decided to write her name on it. So, like, uh, <laughs> um, so who was who was it, Daniel, here. that you were upset with? Paulette or somebody wrote their name on one of your posters. Oh. Um, we got oh, Mrs. Knutson. Yes. We can all we can Antique all take them. Shoot. She's probably Antique dead. Antique sheet music. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so now Kathalina Macalina. I'm not sure. Let's see. Dona Nobis Paka, Zoom Gali Gali, El Kaleli. We got all kinds of fun made up words. The Deaf Woman's Courtship. I'm sorry, why are you learning this in the Girl Scouts? <laughs> <laughs> Deaf Woman's Courtship. No, no silver and gold. The clocks will ye, will ye come back again? The Scottish song of farewell, the foot traveler, a German walking song. Drink to me only with thine eyes. Yeah. So okay. Yep. Yeah, so we just have we just have a little fun, weird um, Girl Scout, Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts sing around the world songs from many lands sung by girl girl scouts of the usa now it does say of the usa and it says produced under the personal supervision of the metropolitan opera star nanette guilford so i don't remember it does i mean the production of it it says it's got girl scouts all over it so it's got to be something related to girl scouts um oh well thank you cat gibbons um so yeah, Girl Scout, the, the Girl Scouts around the world. So this was picked up in that little set of um, of stores in Superior, Wisconsin. So uh, thanks for joining, Cat Gibbons, and thank you so much for the five dollars super chat. It's very kind cool. of you. And uh, thank you for letting me know that uh, Scott Scott was great to work with when I did my last trip uh, to Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm glad that uh, you found me through him. So yeah, so this was kind of a fun a fun item uh, that'll show up in a live sale. But one of the things that I picked up in um, Prox Crocs with a bunch of ephemera. So I don't think Melody was on here, um, but I'm not sure if this falls. And this maybe this needs to go to your. Maybe this. Maybe you need to fight Melody for it, uh, Katie. <laughs> go to my ephemera. What book. makes jelly gel? So it's not a Jello cookbook, which is what Melody tends to collect. So you you might have a little more variety in your uh, menu, but we've got the Jelly Trio. Now, one of the things I found interesting about this one is you can see there's a script, the font that's used for no more guesswork. Somebody was trying to replicate it. I don't know why, <laughs> but they were trying to recreate the N and the M to try and write the way that, I guess they liked the penmanship. They wanted to try and do it. Some, um, some kid 
actually practicing. So the three essentials for gel for gelatin are acid, sugar, and pectin. You know, so we can all feel we all can go to bed at night tonight knowing that that's what you need to make jello gel jelly gel. Um, and then we've got this lovely graphic of two, I guess, people. She works and worries the long haul, the the long boil way. And then the other one, she finds the short boil method is play. Okay. So I guess different ways to boiling. Cause again, this is not jello. This is making jelly. There's a little, some graphics of how to do it. Some recipe. I thought there was recipes in here. How to make jam. Where the recipes go. Okay. So there's recipes for the jam. Let's see if there's any scary recipes that Katie can try. The jam cupboard recipes, uh, <laughs> surprise pastries. The surprise is cream cheese. Jam marguerites, pastel jelly frosting, broiled toppings. Doesn't say what you're supposed to broil. Oh, They're boy. not even. It's not even listed in the ingredients. Just the ingredients are swans down cake flour, wow. sugar, and butter, and then the jam. Yeah, the jelly roll looks good. Oh. So you make your the own old fashioned. Jelly roll does look good. Old fashioned jelly roll. That looks pretty good. So, so, you know, nothing, nothing that involves spam or anything weird, but I just thought that was, so I've got a couple okay, recipe books. At least it's not meat. <laughs> no meat, no meat in the jelly. We're not going to make a Rachel trifle. No meat. Um, we've got the patio, <laughs> the patio picnic cookbook. I thought the graphics on this were kind of cool. Um, you know, I would, I think this one did have a publication date. Was it the 50s or the 60s? 59 was when this one was printed. So there's peanut butter cake, peanut butter broiled frosting. Wow, they're into broiling things. Um, chocolate peppermint pie. Spuddies. What is that doesn't spuddies? sound good. That's place a scoop of place a scoop of Swift's vanilla ice cream on a donut and top with chocolate sauce. So that's called oh, as that that's a, sounds good. It sounds good, but who came up with the name Spuddy? <laughs> that's <laughs> crazy. Sounds like weird potatoes. That's exactly. I'm like, wait, is this like a potato of some sort? So that's all the salads. Uh, sour cream potato salad with sliced ham, Armenian pilaf, hamburger gold mines, barbecued spoon burgers, pork and turkey barbecue buns, Brunswick stew. And just like throughout it, there's just these little illustrations just with these bright green colors and a lot of skewers. Um, I, just, I just thought some of the cookbooks were fun. And because I was in Wisconsin, uh, I came across all of this dairy stuff. So we've got milk, oh, I bet and you did. milk and its uses in the home, protein, fat and sugar, minerals, and then look how they spelled vitamins, vitamins, essential to that growth and health. Wild. And so that one, not too many like recipes. It's really more like what is reconstituted milk, which just that sounds wrong, but there's a whole section on it. Cream, butter, pasteurization and sterilization, the average composition of milk of various kinds. I don't know. When did they invent like 2%? Is this like all whole milk? I don't even know. Source of protein. I don't know. So for your vitamins, one cup of milk is equal to two medium-sized potatoes or two slices of white bread or four ounces of the average beef. So I just thought even... Which I can still hear my grandmother saying that I need to drink all my milk so that I get strong and healthy and she would serve us milk at every meal. Well, because also like a, a certain you know, pastime water wasn't always clean to drink. So at some point if you've milk fresh from the farm or delivered to your doorstep. So this, this little pamphlet is from 1921. So it doesn't have the coolest graphics in it. It's all in black and white, but just from a, as a piece of history, I thought that was kind of fun. There's the tea economy 
I, I don't know if that, I guess that's the brand or Tico is the brand. So Tikonomy Buttermilk Book. And so Tico, the e Eckenberg company. So T-E-C-O is the name of the brand. And it looks like they made pancake flour. So this one's like a little, a buttermilk book by Mrs. Ida C. Bailey Allen contains many economical receipts for the use of Tico self-rising pancake flour. So it says the buttermilk book, but I guess it's for pancakes. How to, to economize. So there's like the little illustrations in some of the recipes. You got the little, the little chef, little Tico chef uh, in there. A um, bunch of recipes, or they call them receipts. And then um, the cool graphic on the back. So they got that. Bancroft Dairy Bank. Oh, look at those graphics. So it's the, it's like one of those little, it's like a little, milk carton, but it's never been used because you can see the slot that you're supposed to pop out for the bank is right, right through the OV, the U, the V, and the E. Um, I think at some point it might have been glued together because there's some discoloration on the bottom. So I don't know at some point it was actually as a box, but nobody ever used it as a bank. So I thought that was kind of cool. Oh, that was fun. And that was when advertising was just so much better. It was. They did. They had so many cool advertising stuff. Um, Hordes Dairyman. This is a, a memo book and calendar from 1963. And just check out the back, the art on the back. You know, you're, you're going to drink our milk, damn it. You know, you got all the cows lined up right there. And then you can subscribe to the Hordes Dairyman magazine. Uh, what th uh, three years, 72 issues for two bucks, <laughs> two dollars to get the, and then all that one is, is like it's just a little notebook, you know. So it's an unused notebook, but in the back is the 1963 calendar. So you got a cool piece with that. We got another, um, this one looks like this is actually a bridge book. So it's issued compliments of the Milton Dairy Company. And it's got the cool art on it. But what it is, when you open it up, it has the information for Bridge and then the tally cards for Bridge stapled into it. Oh, how cool is that? So it's a dairy advertising piece, but it's a functional set. And it's still, I mean, I can't say it's unused, but there's quite a few pages still in here. So if it was used, not much. So pretty good condition. There's a little bit of a tear there at the corner. Um, but yeah, all of this dairy stuff I found. And then this will be the last thing I show. I've got a bunch of other stuff behind me, but I'll, they'll just show up in other sales. This one, I'm literally waiting to open on air because I haven't opened this yet. This is a set of, oh, I'm hearing the fireworks. This is a set of, yeah, what are they called? Good. Rewards of Merit. I'm going to move. So we've got all of this batch, all of this stuff pushed together into one sealed envelope. So I had not opened this, but there's several different styles and sizes. Now, I don't know if they're all rewards of merit or if there's a mix in here. But if you remember, I did a sale when I was in Pennsylvania. Um, Rebecca from Kitchy and Bitchy, she sold some of these and I had never heard of these before. So these would have been issued in the olden days in school. Your teacher would give these at the end of, you know, end of the quarter, end of the school year, issued reward of merit presented to Alfred Gould by, I'm assuming, Carrie, whatever that is, was the teacher's name. So this one I, this was, was on the front. So this one I could see. So that one I think is one of the older ones because it's just the one color. Uh, you had another one that was blue, also reward of merit. But then some of them were getting colorful. So I was like shifting it around, trying to see what, how old all of these were. Unfortunately, I could, unless the ones that I could read, I could not find any dates. So there's another one with the single color reward of merit. Uh, this one's a little bit bigger. Don't know if that was originally colored or if somebody colored that in. So you've got kind of this cool little one. So these were like what you'd get from your teacher. This is what Rebecca taught me at the time. These would be what you'd get from your teacher. Like if you were a good kid, you showed up with school, you uh, 
Um, yeah, they would all be early 20th century, like between 1910 to around 1930s, I guess is where they started dying out. Um, some of them do predate, they exist prior to the 1900s, but I, those, those are super old. And I think, I don't, I think these are printed too well to be that old, but some of them have some great colors to them. A lot of them are small. So I was having a hard time reading, seeing some of them. They kept getting falling behind. Well, this one's cool. Wait a minute, who's that too? It almost looks like it says it's a trusty. But now it looks like it says gusty. All right, who's this too? So there are little rabbits. It's a reward of merit. But look at the name. What What's that first letter? The rest of it is U-S-T-Y. That's definitely an usty. Yeah, it looks like a T. What do you think it is? I think it's a T. I think it's trusty. <laughs> Tusty? I'm not sure. Oh, so Jerry's saying that she's got some of these that her that her mom's. Um, and I it's like I can read cursive, but I just don't know. Like that kind of looks like a Y because it doesn't look like it closes at the top and it's all above the line. So yeah, so Tiger's saying a T or a G. Like a G would at least be a word, gusty. I don't think it would be a person's name, but at least it'd be a word. Um Oh, so L. Ooh, Lusty. Ooh, now that's putting a whole new twist on things, Maria. <laughs> Maybe that's why it wasn't signed by who gave it. But the the rabbits on that are adorable. Does this have a date on it? No, no date on the back. Um, so far, I haven't seen dates on any of these. I think this was similar to one of the other ones I showed. This one's a lot thinner. Like this one appears to be more like paper, where the others were a little bit heavier. Um, I don't know, this one kind of looks a little bit older, but I don't know if that was printed in color or if somebody actually tried to color that in after the fact. This one doesn't actually have the name uh, of who it was sent to, but you can see at the very bottom, it does say teacher. So the idea is it would have been given by the teacher to the student. So that one's got a little bit of foxing on it. Um, so, and the graphics bit, on that, I mean, man, oh man. And from doing the research when I, this was back when Rebecca first started talking about them, like some of these are far more floral or feminine, but they, they appear to have been given out in like unilaterally, you know, it's like, even though this is all flowers, this would have still could have been given to a guy because the teacher was probably female. Um, so this one has a little poem on it. There's some cool ones. There's more in here than I thought there were. So this one just says reward of merit on the front, but it doesn't say, it doesn't look like there's a place to put the to or from, but look at the art on that. That's just really cool. That so it just says the reward of merit there in the corner. I mean, but frame? It doesn't... Can you imagine having that frame? And all of these, like if you just got like a little five by seven or four by six flame and, and put like a piece of velvet in it, and just floated this against it. These would pop so nice. You have this little house. Oh, they would. Reward of merit. So this one's signed by the teacher. And these, like these again, these are a little bit heavier, like a little bit more like a cardstock. This one. Okay, I don't think this is a reward of merit. I don't think because I think this is. I'm assuming this is more like a name card of some sort because it just says the woman's name and then teacher at the bottom. So I don't know if this would have been like maybe her little name card on her desk or maybe for like parent meetings or something like that. I don't know. So this one I don't think is a reward of merit because there'd be no place. I don't see any place where you'd put the kid's name. So this, I, I, I don't know if something like, it's too big to be a business card, but that's just really cool. And the fact that it says teacher, that would just make a really cool gift for a teacher because clearly this is old. Um, looks like it says something at the bottom. Copyright, what? Wow, okay, older than I thought. Copyrighted 1877. So it doesn't mean this is when the card was done. 
Uh, it just means that's when the design was done. But I can't imagine this is any later than 1897. They would have done a different copyright by then. Um, so these are even, this is even older than I thought. So that's, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, yes, uh, definitely Lily of the Valley. And yes, I would say that's a cat lily as well. This one is like super, 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 super thin. And that is amazing to be in such great pain. So this one feels almost like money. Like that's the, the weight of it. This one, I think, this one, I think is old. Uh, there's no dates on it, but just look at the engraving of the design. But then that is definitely a fountain, an ink well pen. That is not a fountain pen signature. And it's got that rust color going into it. Industry, punctuality, and good conduct. So I think that one's going to have some age to it as well. And the fact that it's so thin, I think, backs that up. This one looks like it might be later. This, this like kind of feels like a greeting card style. You know, it's, it's much, much thicker, and it's kind of embossed. So this seems like more of a greeting card. But I don't know when they started doing that to greeting cards. But you can see the design. That's... That's like the tail end of the aesthetic movement. So that would be like 1880s to 1890s, you know, just that design. Um, so maybe it's older than I thought, but I don't know. You can see on the back, it's embossed. I don't know when they started doing that to cards. Ooh, what's this one? This was the biggest one. This was the one I couldn't see. I don't know if this is a reward of merit or not. This one, no, it says presented to, I don't know, it says presented to, and then it has the buy, and it does say teacher. So I guess it's a reward of merit. It does, just doesn't say, but it's like the art is these big boats, and there's a couple that she's wearing a dress that definitely is prior to turn of the century. I'd say that's like an 18, I don't see a big bustle on the back, so like maybe 1890s. Um but I don't know why you'd have these huge boats on a reward of merit. Um, but it doesn't say reward of merit, it just says presented it's to. An interesting design. Yeah, and then it's got all of that aesthetic movement stuff. So again, that would be like 1870s and 1880s would be the aesthetic movement. So unfortunately, this one looks like it's had some damage, like it was like rubbed up against something. So there is some loss to the art. Oh, and the this is applied so it looks it feels like this card was printed and then this you can tell is glued onto it i can feel the ridge so i don't know like it's not a photograph it's still with something printed but maybe you could interchange the design that i'm not sure so okay so josie is saying that that dress is, would be 1880s to 90s so like i'm not like super knowledgeable in fashion um so, but she's saying be that same era. So it doesn't say reward of merit, but the fact that it's with all of these rewards of merit, I'm going to assume that's what it was for. And it does say presented to, I don't know what else you'd be giving it to, but this is the largest of all of them. Like if you compare it to that, really the one that I think might be the oldest, like there's a fairly significant size difference between these. So these will end up in, they might actually go on to Etsy. Like if I can do some research and find some of them, I might put them up onto Etsy, but most likely I'll start putting them into the, into the live sales. I had some, these I got on the trip. I also have the, some of that inflation currency. I sold a, f a few of those pieces in the last live sale. I need to do more research on some of those. Um, what I like about the ephemera is it's lightweight and easy to ship. Um, so like I, I, one of the, piece of currency is going into Canada. And so for the first time I'm shipping something that I'm not charging $20 to ship, you know, something tiny. Um, so it's kind of nice, but uh, I have a couple handful of other things, but it's getting late. I'm starting to see darkness. It looks like Katie's coming to 945. So she's going to have her firework going into her car. So uh, we're going to let things close itself out. I stayed on longer than I'd anticipated, but appreciate you guys hanging out with me. Um, you know, I was kind of like lean a little bit. <laughs> you see some of the other stuff that I didn't show. Uh, oh, this is like my favorite because like no offense to Prox and Crocs, but they didn't know what they had. 
these are this is a salesman's catalog for the um, for the punch punch boards that I'm collecting. So this is like a total huckster item for selling those punch boards. Oh, okay, there's like four, one. there yeah there's like four of these on eBay right now. The cheapest one is a hundred dollars, and the rest are going between two and three hundred dollars. I paid five. And it was a case where he's like, uh, now it, a lot of this stuff wasn't priced. And so he's like, oh, it's not priced. Well, what, what do you think? Five bucks? Sure, I can, I can do that. <laughs> it's like, it's, I would never pay $200 for it anyway, <laughs> but I was very happy to get it for five bucks. Um, so yeah, so I got that. Oh, I got some I got some uranium glass. Got a coaster. Yay. So I got uranium glass. Um, got a got a kids game from the seventies for oh, sound yeah. like some flashcards. Um, oh, this I got from Prox and Crocs too. I don't actually know what it is. He had a whole stack of them, and I just don't know what it is. So it like would have been like something you got with your coal shipment. I don't know. And then a cool issue of Jack and Jill magazine. Um, picked that up. So like, they just had some great ephemera in addition to all the Crocs, which I was just, you'll watch, I'll get the video out either this week or next week, hopefully. And you'll just see, I was in, I was in heaven. So, um, so it's quarter to the hour fireworks will be starting any minute. So I appreciate Katie just hanging out, joining in, you know, sitting in her car. Hope you get home and Louie did not have a meltdown and, uh, that she gets through no, the fireworks. I'm sure Louis's okay. And uh, so let's see what's, what's uh, Michelle saying. The roots are dry, folks, sailor. Yeah, so hopefully watch for fires, yep. all that fun stuff. Uh, but enjoy the fourth, however you choose to do so. And if you get the have the benefit of having tomorrow off, enjoy your three-day weekend. Um, I will just a quick heads up. I will not be having a traditional sale this Thursday. I'm going to pre-record my sale. And what I've decided to do is this is where I'm going to sell all of my copper luster. So I'm going to take a car, a note from uh, Nesting Haven. I'm going to pre-record because while the sale is happening, I'm going to be on stage. So I'm going to ask uh, Kate and Nate, Kate, Kate and Nate, uh, Nate and Katie, to <laughs> go ahead and watch the sale, and I will pop in when I can. But I'm not going to be able to run a traditional sale because I will be on stage. Um, so I will have about a dozen, maybe 15 of my copper luster pieces selling, and uh, it will. The sale part will be brought live, but the video, it'll be a pre recorded video. So watch for that. Try and drop some other stuff. Get Try and get back in the, into the habit of getting videos done and trying to run the rest of my life. So appreciate y'all hanging out with me. I uh, enjoy the 4th of July. If you go to watch your fireworks, stay safe. And uh, thanks again to Katie. Thanks for putting your trust in Trusty Huckster. And Katie, go ahead and give your sign off. And thanks, guys, for tuning in. And I hope, as always, you will stay in. Stay safe and then YouTube. Bye bye. There you now. go. All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of the evening. Talk to you later. Bye bye.